Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When a person demonstrates a commitment to the kingdom of God, there are many benefits. One benefit that we'll see today is godly discernment. That is to say, when you make the priority of your life the kingdom of God, one of the things that God will do by means of the Holy Spirit is that he will give you insight. We've talked about a kingdom perspective, but discernment in making decisions that will not only be a blessing to you in this age, but also after this world ends, after your life ceases and you enter into the kingdom of heaven. We have seen over and over, and I mean just that, how again and again Messiah taught concerning the kingdom of God. That we might understand how important, how vital kingdom truth is to your life. And if you are not totally committed to the kingdom of God, you will not make right decisions. You will not have the discernment to understand what is going on in your life and how to respond to it. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 13. The book of Matthew and chapter 13. Now, many times we see in the New Covenant, whether it's Paul speaking or Messiah or some other apostle, we see that the emphasis is on how to be saved. Sometimes we use the phrase justification, how to find forgiveness of your sins by God's grace so that you can enter into the kingdom of God. But there's other passages of Scripture that deals with not how to be saved, but how to live an obedient life, how to live in such a way that you are going to bring honor and glory to God, carrying out His purposes, being committed to the things that He says are important. And the only way to do that is with a discernment that is a gift from the Holy Spirit. So notice what he says here, Matthew 13 and verse 47. We read, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net. Now, this is just not any type of net. This is a net for fishing. What a fisherman would cast into the sea, and that's exactly what this example is of. Look again at our text, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net, having been cast into the sea, and from every type it is gathered. So we see here that God is doing something. He's teaching us that in life we gather things. And if we're going to be pleasing to him, doing things that he would have us to do, then we have to have that discernment, as we'll see in a moment. So these things are gathered up, which when it is filled, that is, the net is full, it is lifted up onto the shore, the seashore. And what happens? We'll keep reading. They sit down, those are the fishermen, and they gather up the good things into the vessel. Now, here's the key. In order to gather the good things, you have to know what is good and what is not good. And you cannot leave that to your own knowledge, your own perspective. In order to discern what is truly good, you need to hear from the Holy Spirit. And it's only when you are committed to kingdom purposes, 
then and only then are you going to have that ability to discern and gather up those things which are good and place them into vessels. Keep reading. But the things that are corrupt. Now, we see there are simply two types of things. Those things, and the word here is good. What does that mean? Those things that are related to the will of God. And the other things, the word here means corrupt. They are in a state of decay. They are not going to last. So here's the question. In life, you're striving, you're working, you're doing things. But here's the problem. The vast majority of people, they are striving, they are laboring, they are working, they are consumed with those things, pursuing them, asserting their will in a given situation so that they can accomplish what they want in order to ascertain their objectives. And here's the problem. So frequently, for the vast majority of people, what they are, are pursuing, what they have in possession, are those things which are decaying and will not last and will not have anything to do with the kingdom of God. And therefore, what does Paul say about this? He writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that, that such minded people without discernment, they're going to suffer loss. Now, here's the biblical truth. You, when you go before God on judgment day, and we're going to see judgment is always at the foundation of Messiah's teaching. It is so sad, it is misfortunate, it is an error, it is rooted in a wrong perspective. When people don't think about judgment, thinking, oh, God's grace is so, there's no more judgment. That is a lie. There is indeed a judgment day coming. And if you have discernment, if you are kingdom-minded, that judgment day is going to be a day of not loss, but rewards. It is going to be a day of receiving, but for those who make worldly decisions, not kingdom decisions, but worldly, these individuals, they are going to suffer loss. It is going to be the worst day, and that day is going to lead into an eternity of, of something. What is that? Well, just keep reading. So one who has discernment, they gather in the good things into the vessels. But the corrupt things, they cast outside. And the emphasis here in the text is outside. Keep reading verse 49. Thus will be at the, the end. When this age comes to an end, a conclusion. Thus will be at the end of the age. What's going to happen? The angels are going to go forth and they are going to separate the evil from the midst of the righteous. Now, hear this. We see that there's two types of goods. That which is good, meaning according to God's will, and that which is corrupt. That will have no lasting quality. That will be lost and gone forever. Don't build your life on the pursuing of those things that from the kingdom perspective, they are rubbish. They are in the state of decay. They will not last. And likewise, he says, the angels at the end of the age, at the consummation of this world, the angels are going to go forth and they're going to do something. What does the scripture say? Well, these angels, you can believe that they're going to have discernment. And they are going to separate, separate the evil from the midst of the righteous ones. And here's the key. There are only two possibilities. There is either that which is evil. What's evil? In conflict with the things of God. Or there is that which is righteous. And biblically speaking, we see that righteousness is an outcome of faith. 
We see that, for example, taught in the book of Genesis. We see Paul emphasizing that, for example, in, in the book of Romans chapter 4 and 5. But here's another important truth. We see a relationship between righteousness and the manifestation of God's glory. And when God's glory is manifested, here's the key. Good things, blessed things take place. So the angels are going to go out and they are going to separate. Only two possibilities. That which is corrupt, that which is evil, and that which is righteous, that which is kingdom related. Look now to the last part of, of verse 50. He says here, and they will cast them into the furnace. Now, this is clearly a reference to judgment, a literal judgment. Those who are corrupt, those who are evil, those who are not part of the kingdom of God, what's going to happen to them? Angels will gather them up, and the scripture says, and cast them where? Cast them into the furnace of fire. And fire so frequently has to do with God's last day's judgment. And this judgment is not for a season. It is forever and ever and ever. So you're going to spend eternity in one of two places, either in the midst of an eternal fire or in the kingdom of God. Now, I can tell you something without any doubt whatsoever. I know this to be a fact. There is not going to be anyone who's in the kingdom of heaven that has any regret about being there. And there's not going to be anyone who's experienced this fire judgment that is not going to be grieved eternally with great regret that he made a terrible decision, that he rejected that gospel message, that he was not kingdom-minded and did not love the king of that kingdom, Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus of Nazareth, what the world calls Jesus Christ, the anointed one. And why is he the anointed one? Because he was sent by his heavenly father to provide salvation, to lay down his life so that we could have eternal life. So there is going to be those who are cast into the furnace of fire where there's going to be. What is their eternal destiny? Those who did not behave with discernment, those who were not kingdom minded, where there's going to be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Now, it's interesting because that phrase, the gnashing of teeth, it's in the definite position. What does that mean? Well, that quality of being definite means that there is a specific gnashing of teeth associated with God's eternal judgment. You don't want to be part of that. Well, let's press on to the next verse, verse 51. And Yeshua said to them, Do you understand these things? And let me attest to you, you need to understand these things. These things need to be the basis of your life. So he says to them, Do you understand these things and they said unto him yes and pay attention to that next word now if you're using a translation that's based on a faulty greek text it ends right there but if you're using a translation which is based on a proper greek text there's another word just not yes but yes lord and here's the key when one is kingdom-minded, they are going to recognize Yeshua, that is Jesus, as Lord. And he becomes the focus of their life. And their objective is serving him, pleasing him. And you know what's so wonderful about that? When you do that, the outcome is going to be joy. Joy in this world, but here's the key. Joy for eternity. So he says, do you understand these things? These are kingdom-related things. And what do they say? Yes, Lord. Verse 52. And he said to them, 
on account of this, every scribe that is learned, and pay attention to this, every scribe, by and large scribes, we don't have the time to go into who they were, but they were experts in the scripture. And if you are an expert in the scripture, and you're properly trained, you are going to understand kingdom things. Now, remember, I talked about discernment as we began. And this is where the basis for that, that doctrine of discernment and kingdom-mindedness comes from, because he says, on account of this, every, every scribe that is trained in the kingdom of heaven, he is like a man, not just any man, a man who is the owner of a house. Now, this word refers to an owner of a house, but understand its implications. It means someone that has authority. He possesses someone, something, and with that possession comes responsibility, authority. And what does this one do? Well, notice, he is like a man a householder, the owner of the house, who cast out from his treasure, here's his possession, all that he has. He cast out from his treasure the new and the old. Very important that we understand what is being said here. He has discernment for that which is new. And by the way, you study the book of Revelation well. And you will find out, and this is true not just there, but it's very, very clearly taught in the book of Revelation, but it's clearly taught other places as well. For example, in the book of Jeremiah in 31, that word new is related to kingdom. And the word old is related to this world. So what he's saying is this. Every stride, everyone who understands the word of God who has been trained in, what does it say? Trained in the kingdom of God. He is a person who has achieved, he has possession, he is an owner, and he is able to cast out from his treasure and make a discernment between that which is new, kingdom-related, and those things that are related to the world. He has discernment. Look now to to verse 53. And it came about when Yeshua completed these parables. And remember a parable. It is something that contains wisdom, a short statement that is full of wisdom that should govern your life, rule your life. So it came about when Yeshua had completed these parables that he withdrew, he departed from there. And after coming into, and pay attention to this, after coming into his own region. Now this is the, the area of his homeland, where he is from. So after coming into the region of where he's from, he was doing something. It says he was teaching, and pay very close attention. The grammar here is in the imperfect. What does that mean? Well, he had been teaching in the past, and he was teaching presently, but that teaching would not go on. It would come to an end at that time. Realize that, that things come to an end. This is an opportunity to be able to cast your eyes upon the word of the Lord. Read scripture. You're not going to always have that opportunity to hear the word of God and respond to it. Take advantage of it. So what did he do? He was teaching the word of God in their synagogues so that, notice, that they were astonished. Now, listen to that. They had heard people teach before. I mean, every day in the synagogue, there were lessons. People would study God's word, share, teach the revelation of scripture. But when Yeshua did it, it says they were, and this is a very significant, a very powerful word. They were astonished and they said, from where to this one? Now, it's very important 
They are mystified. They have a question. From where? What is the source to this one? This wisdom, such wisdom and such miraculous powers. He's able to do so many different things. Now we know he can do all things. But here in this contest, it speaks about the variety of his power to do various miracles. And they ask the question, look at verse 55. They say, is not this one, and over and over, Yeshua here is being addressed as this one, this one. Why? It is a word that shows unique, that he's different from everyone else. So they ask the question, is not this one the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Miriam or Mary? And his brothers, are they not Yaakov, James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Judah, Judah? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Verse 57. They ask that same question again. Therefore, from where is it this one? All these things. Now they recognize he is unique. He is different. They've never heard anyone share scriptural truth like he does. That they are amazed by him. And they begin to ask the question, where is such wisdom from? Where is such power? And it's in the plural. Miracles that he did. What is the source of this? And you know, there's only one answer. And that identifies who he is. Yes, in a physical sense, an earthly sense, he is the son of a carpenter. But his identity, and hear this, he was God, he is God, and he is forever God. That never changes. Fully man, but fully God. And he is the son of the most high God, which speaks to his divinity. Where is this power coming from? Where is this wisdom coming from? It's coming from God, which relates to his identity. And notice something that's, that's so hard to understand. And if you ask me, what is the basis for this difficulty? I want to say what the basis is for the difficulty before I say what the difficulty is. Now, I've been teaching in another venue on the book of Exodus. And there God says to Moses, in referring to the children of Israel, Kashe Orf, what does that mean? A stiff neck. That they are a stiff neck people. Now, don't be so hard upon the children of Israel because all nations tend to be stiff necked all people tend to have a problem with pride. We all tend to be selfish. Israel simply was, was very visible. Why? Because the word of God was given to them. We all have that tendency not to want to submit to the good instruction of God. But notice what it says. They ask, don't we know this family? We know that his father is the carpenter, Joseph. His mother, she's with us, Mary. We know his, his brothers, his brothers, Yaakov and Joseph and Simon and Judah. And we know the sisters, they're with us. Therefore, look at verse 56 at the end. Therefore, from where to this one is all these things? And we know the answer, from God. But notice their response. Verse 57, and they were offended at him. Now, this word is a unique word. I've mentioned it several times. It repeats over and over in Matthew's gospel. It is a word for scandalous. Now, sometimes, you know, bad things happen. There are things that may be a little bit embarrassing, maybe something that causes you to feel ashamed. But, but this goes beyond this. This is scandalous. And you think for a moment 
about all the wonderful miracles that he did in the Galilee. How he blessed people, helped people, loved people. And what are they? When they see his uniqueness and that he's from them, they are offended. Now, what is that reminiscent of? Well, if you're a good student of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, you know how hard it was for the sons of Jacob to accept their brother, Joseph. The dreams that he received, the revelation, and how God wanted to use him. And this is what we're seeing here, a rejection by the people who literally knew him the best. Why? Jealousy, pride, that, that stiff neck. And therefore, once again, verse 57, and they were offended by him. But Yeshua said to them, this isn't a surprise to him, nothing surprises him. He says, is not a prophet without honor, meaning a prophet's only without honor, where? Except in his own country, in his own region. It's those people, because of pride, jealousy, they don't want to receive him. And that's what we see here. They should be thankful. They should be excited. They should be joyful that one of their own, from their own town, God is using. That God is called to be not just a prophet, but the prophet, the one that Moses spoke of, who is indeed the Redeemer, the Savior. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. In other words, the Messiah. So he says, it's only in one's own country that a prophet is without honor. And in his own household. Those who knew him best. And therefore, last verse, look at verse 58. And because of this, what is this? We'll come to it. It says, and... He did not do there. Why is that word so important there? Because there is related to that country, his own place. He did not do there many miracles because of their faithlessness. And that word faithlessness means that they were against believing. They were convicted, but they rejected that because of that pride, that jealousy. Don't allow pride to cause you to lack kingdom discernment. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.